All right, cool. So yeah, we'll go over sections 25 today, since just you and me, Stephen. <laughs> um, but uh, let me go ahead and share out. I do have a little lesson plan I usually put together. And since we haven't, I haven't had you before, it might be useful to share this to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to send it through your chat right now. Okay. So yeah. So this is what I'm going to go over today. Um, and right now, to be honest, it, some of it, uh, for example, section six and seven of this uh, part will not be completed yet. Um, plan is to go into next next study group. We'll talk about maybe section six or section uh, part six and seven before we talk about actually modeling time series. So yeah, so section 25, um, it's just about time series. So uh, now um, I'll kind of go through this, you know, let me know if there's parts that you're kind of questioning, you know, always helps me out. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and start sharing out my screen. Let's see, okay, and last time I shared out my screen, <laughs> uh, no one told me I was on the wrong screen. So what happened was uh, people, <laughs> Uh, people were looking at the wrong screen the whole time, and I couldn't. I didn't realize until I got like five minutes into it. So uh, let me know if uh, it should show right now. Time series. Uh, there's like sections one through seven. This thumbs up for me if that's right. Or, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So good. <laughs> I want to make sure because last time uh, I accidentally showed the wrong screen. So okay. So the first thing is you know uh, what is time series. So again, some of the stuff you probably know, Stephen, since you know. Um, sounds like you've had this before, but we'll go over it anyway. Uh, time series basically is like, um, it, it's data that is specific where there's a, a strong importance to uh, the progression of time. So like you can think of a lot of data point, like a lot of data, um, they have, what's it called? Like um, they'll have time in there, for example, like if you look, think back into our housing prices, uh, there was something like, you know, the date it was, uh, maybe um, like the date it was built or maybe the date it was assessed, um, something along those lines. But um, it wasn't necessarily the, the key part of the data. And that's what makes a time series very different is that the key part is not the individual data points, but the fact that it actually comes across each, what's it called, um, each, data, each data point is really the important part is the time itself. And we have a progression of time. Uh, so that's what that makes a big difference of what a time series is. Basically there's a temporal focus. Hey, Saad, glad you can join in. Um, we just started up. So, uh, sorry. Um, so basically, again, the key focus is the temporal aspect of it, and that's what makes a time series uh, time series data very different from a normal set of data. The way I like to think about it is like um, the time series. Like, if you took out the time from it, would the data have still have the same impact? And a lot of times, you take the time out of the time series, it's like, oh, it wouldn't make any sense anymore, or at least it wouldn't be as meaningful. And that's the important part. Okay. So um, some examples, like some class examples are stock prices. Stock prices are like the classic example just because there's so much data on stocks. Um, and it's also very important in the sense that people really care if you can predict stock prices, um, you can make a lot of money, right? Uh, for the record, be very careful with this, um, unless you get like really well. There are, um, what's it called, uh, time series predictions and stuff like this for stock prices. Um, but just let you guys know is that after just today or even like, you know, after this course, there's a lot more to go into it. I don't want you guys to lose thousands of dollars. I've actually known people who have gotten, uh, felt a little more confident than they probably should have um, and they lost quite a bit of money. So just be aware of this. But uh, anyway, this is the same, this is the concept. And there are people who actually do this. It's just um, it's something that there's a lot of subtleties to it. But um, other things like temperature over the year. So you'll see this a lot with like climate climate data and stuff like this, uh, atmospheric changes. Um, I think the curriculum even shows that it's part of the sections. Um, talks about carbon, uh, carbon dioxide levels, which is really interesting because um, we know from the data that uh, carbon dioxide levels have increased over you know, the decades, um, but also interesting because it's also periodic. And you actually see um, the carbon dioxide levels go up and down throughout the year, um, which is really interesting. It, we'll learn this is a periodic trend, but it's also an upward trend. So we actually see the overall carbon dioxide level go up, but we also see this fluctuating up and down, up and down. Um, real quick, um, you guys know what I'm talking about what I'm saying, going up and down, up and down. Um, this is kind of a fun fact. For uh, atmospheric data for carbon dioxide, why do you think it would go up and down like that uh, throughout the year? Um, something to do with the seasons, like more electricity being used. So like more, 
you know, depending on the power, how they got their power. Okay, cool. So it could be possibly electricity. Um, the lower domain knowledge, I think it's really interesting. It's because of the tr uh, basically plants. Uh, basically, there tend to be more plant growth during the when, you know, during the summer and spring months of, on the northern hemisphere. And so you actually see this fluctuation of how much carbon dioxide is actually being absorbed versus it's not absorbed. So you can actually see this little fluctuating back and forth. It's pretty cool. Um, anyway, this kind of show you like, you know, like different things you can see in time series. And we'll see a lot of them. So the first step, um, like the curriculum shows, is loading in a time series. So I just have, um, most of the stuff I have right now is from the curriculum. So just know that like you'll see, if you go through the curriculum again, um, you'll see the similarities. I was part of the code. I try to keep it like, you know, I try not to produce too much new stuff. That way you can reference it back. But you can see here we have this uh, little CSV file called me temp. And the first thing we should, you know, I like to do is always just like look at the data, just do a head, right? That's always a good practice to just say, all right, I have the data, what's it look like? And you can see very quickly, it's like, okay, cool, there's only two columns, there's date and daily min. In this case, um, it's the minimum temp for that uh, day. And in this case, we don't really know about what specific location, but we can assume in here, it's probably some location of some sort um, or have trouble the world or something. Okay? And we can see the dates formatted as it's month, day, year, okay? which again, you know, we don't really like that particular way just because um, there's a lot of ways to order or in order to order dates, it would be nice to be able to have it like year, uh, month, day would be the easiest. Obviously having something called a date time would be useful. So you can see here, I dealt with the uh, dot info and we can see there's two columns, the date right here, which is an object. In this case, an object is just essentially a string in Canvas. And then we have a float here. So we see, okay, some decimal points or anything. So one thing we wanna do is like, well, it's really, Canvas is really nice um, because time series are so important. Um, if we can make it into a date time variable. So if we can instead take this string, which is like, that's all right, we could separate it out maybe to like year, month, day, but because it's a time series, we really would like to have that date to have specific meaning. So we can actually convert this to a date time, okay? So here I just take the data frame, and I'm just saying, okay, the date column, and I'm just converting it to a date from, uh, what's it, a date time, okay, to this date time function. And note that I have this format here, and this represents the day, the month, the year. Oh, so I misspoke, it was supposed to be day, month, year. So that's important to always double check, right? So I probably did something like, if I did like 20, you probably would see, oh, it goes up to 20. Like, oh, well, that's probably the day, then, not the month. So this right here is really useful. This um, notation, this percent D, percent M, percent Y, um, even though it's meant specifically for those two dates times, it's pretty common throughout all the programming stuff um, when you're formatting dates and stuff like that. So definitely useful to look this up. Um, you can also separate out like time and hours and you know, uh, even sometimes like, uh, what's it called, like the day of the week or like, you know, if it's written out as like April, like APR, you know, you can do that too. That's built into a lot of these, um, into this formatting string. Just looking up like the, what letter represents, just have to go look up the doc documentation, okay? But anyway, that's what this is saying. It's like, all right, it's formatted into day, month, year, it separates it out. And then it creates basically right here is our index. And the reason why we're doing this is because we're saying, hey, the most important part of this data that like kind of gives meaning to the data, it's not the fact that they're individual data points, but the fact that they are on a time spectrum here. So like we actually want to say the index is the date itself, not the, the point, which is really what the default is. You're saying this is the zero point, the first data point, the second data point, and so on. Okay. So we run this guy right here, and now we can see when we run our head, it's going to be a little nicer. We actually have a real date. And you can see here, Pam, it's kind of, um, you guys probably have noticed this before, but in an index, uh, it will actually make it so it's a little at a different higher, hierarchy level, which makes it easier to see. But if you also look at the dot info, we can actually see the date and time index right here. And then we can see that now we have a oh, date time index, sorry. <laughs> we actually have a date time, okay, instead of having our, um, what's it called, our objects. So again, it just makes it a little more formatted and useful. And the reason why we do this is we can do a few things really useful with Canvas. Like one of the things um, is slicing the data. So for example, if I want to get everything that's after 1990, okay, I can actually just pass it directly here for the data frame the index and it's already a date and time. I can say, all right, take everything from 1990 onward, right? And that will show me everything that's past it. In fact, if I do like a head, like let's say like 15 seconds so like the next year, you can see it shows up everything that's, oh, well not next year, but the next day, right? If I wanted before that, you can do the dot tail. You can see oh, the times before that, right? So useful because that way I can just pass it directly into Canvas, okay? Again, because time series is pretty common and also can be really useful, okay? So, um, 
like I said, like why would we make the dates as the index? It's basically just to um, make the emphasis that this data is the, the important part, the real aspect of the data is the time itself. And we'll use that time to actually do prediction and uh, do a bunch of other things. Okay. So any questions on uh, making the date time readable or anything like that? Pretty good stuff though. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. So what is the data type after you transform it to a date time? Is the data type date time? That's right. It's a date time format. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so it actually encodes uh, information about uh, the time itself, essentially. In this case, it doesn't date. And uh, uh, um, off the top of your head, is there a case you can think of where you wouldn't want the time to be the index, but you would still want to use it as a time series? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm trying to think of cases where you might have something like a proxy for the time period. Um, let's say, for example, you have something, some, I don't know, something that comes in sequence. Like it's the first one, second one at regular intervals. So maybe it's just labeled all the um, data. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, but you know from context that it's like every five seconds. And there's also on one of the columns is the date it was recorded, or maybe even like the date and the hour it was recorded. But those would be the same bunch of times, even though it's like one, two, three, four, five. So it's happening every five seconds, you know, on this specific date. In that case, um, you wouldn't want to make just, you know, it's going to have the date make that into an index. You might have to actually make, you can either treat the one, two, three, four, five, that's essentially the index all perfectly, um, Based or for more robustness, you probably would do a transformation, make a new column called, you know, like the time or something like that, and take the date, what you know, and then the context of one, two, three, four, five, and basically create a new time from that. That way you have it's very clear saying, oh, this is a time series and this is the exact time the data was recorded. So, yeah, I, I kind of like the only case I can really think of, like when you would use a time series and there's a date in there, but you wouldn't use it. Um, basically, you have to realize, like, what is, you basically want the thing to describe a progression. Um, and there's nothing wrong, necessarily, with having, like, just the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, it's just that it makes it, if you convert it into a daytime um, object, it might make more sense to be able to, like, um, what's it called, like, manipulate it with pandas better. Um, but the important part is to basically have that progression. And plus, if it's just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like, something like that, um, it's not clear that they're equally spaced. It's equally spaced five seconds. It's better to make it more explicit data, especially if you're trying to combine other data. So, for example, if you're combining data that goes every five seconds, but then another one goes also every five seconds, but like it's off by two seconds. So it's like this one, and then like three seconds later, it's this one, and then two seconds later, it's this one, and then five, three seconds later, it's this one. And you want to combine those together. It makes sense to say, all right, let's just do an explicit time, an explicit time over here versus just using like an index number. Th that makes sense, yeah. So almost inevitably, it, it's just best to get like a, a robust, really precise date time index to use yeah. for the progression. Is what it's yeah, I, yeah, definitely. And I think um, sometimes too, like for example, this is just for a day, but sometimes if you want to combine it with a day, which we'll see in the example like in just a second, um, sometimes it makes sense to like extend it out further and say, all right, even though it's just a day, we're going to extend it out, out as if it's 12 o'clock midnight, for example. Usually, pretty good standard, and that way we can compile it with later on. Now you have to be very careful with that because let's say you extend this out to twelve o'clock midnight, but then later on you combine with data that was collected over, um, I don't know, something along the lines of like, uh, like at six p.m. you know in the day, and then you'd say this is twelve o'clock midnight. Well, now you're and you're now saying that this is twelve o'clock midnight and it's six p.m. But in reality, this is just you put something on there. So that's something you should be aware of too. Um, but we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, any other questions? At least so far. Alright, cool. So we'll look at the model of resampling. So resampling, um, the main idea you can think about this is um, you're taking the time series that you have and you're doing it at a particular frequency. And what I mean by that is that like when we're kind of like you can think of sampling, right? When we sample something, we take parts of the data. Resampling is kind of like saying, all right, we have this time series. We're taking parts of the data. So for example, when I say at a particular frequency, if you imagine, like I said, the, the carbon dioxide level, you can actually see it changes throughout the year, but then changes over decades. You might, for example, resample, so you only look at just the year per year versus like a month per month basis. Because the month per month basis, you'll see this periodic, you know, going up, going down, going up, going down, but you really care about the overall trend. Or the other way you could do it is like, well, what if you just want to look at how each year changed? Maybe, for example, you want to see if maybe certain year, um, if over time, maybe the years themselves, like, you know, going from, let's say, winter to summer, um, the 
for example, a down sampling. And basically, uh, down sampling, you're resampling at a lower rate, which basically means like um, you can think like uh, instead of looking at every single like let's say like there's a uh, month, you're looking at instead like you, or sorry, instead of every day, you look at every month. So what you can do, you might lose information if you're not careful. Um, you can lose information basically by averaging over something like that. Whenever you do something like an average, you always have to be very aware that you're essentially summarizing the data for ease of use, but you're losing information, right? Obviously, if we take all this information and convert it into one you know, number like a mean, uh, we lose information about the distribution. Uh, that's just true for all statistics. So just be aware of that. Like you could lose information, and that information might be important. You have to keep aside. But what's my thing is more computation efficient. Basically, you have less data points. You don't have to look at every single data point. You can look at a smaller number. So if you have one that comes up every second, maybe you don't need some data that comes up every second. Maybe you need something that's closer to every minute or even every hour or every day. Like once like data is almost like too much. So this is why it can be much more computationally efficient. Okay. So this example um, from the um, my biology curriculum. So this one, uh, we're actually going to be looking at the same data. Uh, data frame we had before, which I think was the minimum temperature, right? And we're just going to sample it over a month. So this about three sample right here, and you'll see this MF. Um, basically, this is the documentation. It has there's a bunch of different ways you can resample, um, but you have to kind of just look at them essentially. It's not like I can't tell you what the exact way. Just like with um, what's it called? Uh, going through the date time when we're converting with that format, you just have to know what it's going to look like. So just be aware of that. But you can see here, I just started resampling it so I get every month, and I'm basically grouping it. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm grouping it by every month, and then doing a mean for each one. So now each data point will be a month data point. So if I look at this now, and I have a mean, you can see I now have, okay, here's January, here's February, here's March, right? And you can see I now have that daily minimum average compared to when I had the original one. So I have, what was it, that CF? You can see here that was for every day. So I just averaged it over that month. Okay. So again, this is like a, re, a way you can re sample it so you can every month. Um, it's a different frequency instead of having every day, every month. Okay. Um, any questions on the now standpoint? Okay, that one seems pretty uh, that one to me seems pretty straightforward. The yeah, upsampling is another one. We're basically re sampling at a higher rate. And this should actually keep all information. And a lot of times with upsampling we do this to merge data, um, data series, so we have multiple data series, or um, if we want to interpolate, um, interpolate, yeah, basically we want to extend what we have already. So, for example, if we have data that is going um, every, you know, let's say like every hour, but we only have the ones that are at like, you know, that 12 o'clock at night kind of thing, we might want to upsample it so we can combine the one that's every hour with the one that only had the date, or uh, like the day of. Uh, so we'll see this example. So that first example, like if we want to combine parts, we might do something like called a net average frequency. So this basically resamples at 12 hours, every 12 hours, and it'll do average frequency. So we'll, we'll see what this looks like. So remember the original data, this was 19, 81, 01, 01. And basically it's like, oh, every 12 hours, in this case, 12 o'clock midnight, 12 p.m., 12 o'clock midnight, 12 p.m., and so on. And you can see here, basically, it's like, okay, that part where we didn't have, um, what's it called? We didn't have you know that time aspect of it. We're just going to use that at 12 o'clock, and then for or 12 o'clock midnight, and then for 12 p.m., we're just going to put that as blank. Basically, say, oh, we don't have that information. So this is going to be useful if we do have information that was specifically collected at 12 p.m. We can combine that into there and actually add this part in there and compare. Them. That way, we can fill those blanks. Um, but we're not also um, what's it called mixing the data. And that depends on context. Okay. So uh, the other option is actually taking the information and just filling it out. So for example, here it's the same idea every 12 hours, but instead what we do now is we're actually filling it out each of those 12 hours at the same time. So every time we see you know, our data from um, January 1st right here in 1981, we just put it with 20.7, okay? And you can do this with, you know, more, for example, one hour. I'm doing it one hour, I can make it so every hour is still a 20.7. So this might make, this action might make more sense depending on what kind of data you're looking at, right? Um, and you have to figure out what makes sense when you are taking your data. And that mostly this is used for like combined data, but it can also be used for like um, trying to make predictions further out. So if we have an average, it might make sense to say, all right, we'll start off with everything as this hour, 
So what's kind of nice is um, visualizing impact series can actually, there's a lot of ways you can do this. So the first way, probably the most obvious, is you want to visualize changes over time. Okay. So for example, the um, reason why we want to do this is we can identify patterns and trends with these visualizations. So um, I've said this plenty of times and I'll keep saying it, is that one of your best aspects of being a data scientist, besides just the skill of like, you know, like, you know, doing the math, doing, you know, the coding, you know, doing the programming part, and all this stuff in business, is that your human aspect, is that you bring context to the data, you understand how things work. It's like, you should be able to look at the domain knowledge, the context, and bring that life into data. And one of the things you can also do, like I said, is that people are very good at identifying patterns, which is why we do visualization, is that it's not going to tell us immediately the exact thing, but by human nature, we're pretty good at seeing information uh, presented visually and processing that and saying, hey, you know, there looks like to be a pattern here, there looks like to be a trend in here, there seems to be something funny right here, and that's when you can dig in deeper. Of course, visualizations aren't going to fix everything, but it can give you a very quick idea of what's going on. Yeah. So here we just have the New York Stock Exchange data. Um, this again was from the curriculum, so I think this is almost exactly uh, copied directly from here. But it's the New York Stock Exchange and it has the average monthly return just from 1961 to 1966. Okay. So you can see here real quick, we'll just look at this data. There's only two columns. We get the month index, the date time, right? Uh, the index here, and we can see, okay, so from 1961, we have our returns. You see some are positive, some are negative. Okay, all that stuff. Um, and then we can see there's 72, which makes sense. There's only 12 months in a year, six years, 1961 to 1966, right? So we have 72 data points. Okay. So the first one, probably the most obvious one, is the line plot. And our line plot basically will just connect all the data points together. So we can see here our data points, basically our first data point, second data point, and connecting it all together. And so this is the most obvious one. This is probably like what most people would probably, like I would first think, like, oh, I plot, like that's all connected, right? And you can see it's uh, clear going up and down, you know, you can follow each data point. Um, depending on what your data is though, for example, maybe there's a lot of um, like little time changes. For example, let's say you're doing a stock exchange instead of every day, you're doing it like every minute or every second. Obviously you want to want to see every little tiny um, movement you might, but for a long period of time, it just might make, make it more noisy. And so sometimes you can actually use um, another method to see that same um, change over time. And one option is a dot plot. So a dot plot, uh, we'll see in a second. Okay, so it's the same exact data. At this point, we're just not connecting the information. Now, the quick thing you'll probably notice here is that, at least in my opinion, when I look at this, I'm like, I, it's hard for me to see any trends. It's hard for me to see what's going on, which might be useful if it's a very dense plot. Like, is there an actual trend that we see in here? Well, not really. Like maybe this is random. Um, in this particular case, it's probably not the best, just because the data is not very dense, right? So um, just know the difference between these two things. Usually, when we use our line plot, where it's like a clear going up and down, and we want to see that connection, like when did it go up, when did it go down. Um, this is pretty good when it's not too dense. When the data is very dense, um, and there are large swings, and we don't necessarily care about each individual point moving up and down, but we want to see the overall trend, for example. Like maybe we see this, for example, tend to go upward, or like, you know, there's some kind of like fluctuation, some kind of pattern. A dot plot might be useful. So what I would say, um, the easiest way to go is to go, like, oh, which one should I use? I'd say go with one of them, and it's like, I'd probably go with line plot first, because that one, to me, at least makes the most sense. You look at it and you say, does this make sense to me? Or is it really messy? And you say, all right, it's kind of messy. Let me go ahead and try to do a dot plot. And sometimes that will help clear up. Like, like okay, I can see more clear patterns. The line doesn't add extra information, basically. And then, of course, there's other ways to we'll plot it, too. But this is a pretty much the two standards that we can um, do to plot out uh, how things change over time. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. No. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, another thing you should know, too, is that you can you can change your style. Oops. <laughs> and just know there's a bunch of stuff in that list. So, for example, you can put different icons. So, if you want to do, for example, multiple plots um, for dot plot, you can change different styles to make sure you can tell what it is. So, you can do a triangle. I don't know why it would give me. Yeah. Graph goes. You guys went away. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I monitor. Just look that for a second. Um, just know that plotting is not my <laughs> strong suit. There's so many different options. Um, so just know that you know if you want to do these different things, you can look it up. But um, 
inside just the line of dots mod. We can actually do like, um, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, if we have like multiple parts, or I said like if we split up into like different years, we might want to do this grouping and we say, okay, like let's look at it a year to year versus like all of it at once. So if we look back on our live plot, you can see this is all of the stock exchange data from 1961 to 1967. So maybe you want to look at from like January to like, you know, December for each year and compare each part. So this is really useful, for example, like talk about temperature. Well, temperature obviously changes over time, but it changes throughout the season too. Um, stock exchange data is not usually the best one to kind of go up because there's not really necessarily a seasonal change in stock exchange data, um, but we can still apply it to this. So in this case, we have an example where all are separating annually. So again, this is all from the curriculum. So I basically group them by annual frequency, right? In this case, I will actually plot them all out so they're individually put out for each year. So you can see here, it's the IEC 1961, 62, 63, 64, and so on. And you can see I have, you know, from the beginning, in this case, it's January, all the way to December. And you can see, it's like, oh, I can see this general, like, idea. I think it's stacked them on top of each other. And maybe, for example, uh, this could be useful, like, we want to look at multiple years and see, you know, which one is, or sort of a general trend. Okay. Um, for the most part, I don't know about you guys, I can't really see a general trend here, too. Um, and maybe, for example, like we just wanted to see the pattern, how it changes, but you'll notice here this goes from 0.5, you know, to like, you know, the 0 to 0 0.5, and negative here. These are all at different scales, essentially. So this is good to see like a general pattern to see like, oh, for example, let's say for temperature, it gets cold, you know, it starts cold in the winter, gets hotter in the summer. We can actually see that general trend over the year, over that time period. But let's say we wanted to see, hey, is there like an actual match for the data, like the value. So for example, these might fluctuate more than others. So we can do them all together. We can plot them all on top of each other. So you can see here, this way we can still see that general pattern, but also we can see, okay, like how does it fluctuate compared to everything else? And again, uh, stock exchange is probably not the best one to show this just because it's kind of hard. Um, there's not really seasons, but in seasonal data, the data that makes sense where there is a season or a seasonal difference, um, this could be really important to actually plot out and see this overall pattern. So, for example, like with uh, uh, carbon dioxide, we know carbon dioxide is going up over time. Uh, you might want to plot it out per year, and you might see that you know even though everything's going up like this, and you plot them all together, you can actually see the carbon dioxide going up each time. So that might be something that's important to check out. Or if you see more that uh, just also drops down. Um, general rule I would say is that um, colors are useful to uh, see which specific ones. But if you have more like 10, like maybe 10 or 12 is probably the most. If you have more of that, like if you're doing like, let's say 100 years for each year, I would suggest actually turning off color or maybe grouping the color by decade. For example, all blue ones will be from 1960, 1970, all green will be 1970, 1980. Just because if you add too much information in the visualization, it just makes it a lot harder to read that information from the graph. Okay, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. All right, any questions on um, any of these two things I showed? Okay, cool. So yeah, these are the pretty simple ones. I think these are like the ones that you would think also probably like in, back in grade school, like that's what you would do. The next part's a little uh, more advanced, but we've seen a lot of these things in distribution. So sometimes instead of seeing how it changes over time, we instead want to see the distribution of the values themselves. So what I mean by that is um, when we look at, you know, for example, a line plot, or you know a dot plot, plot like this, we're seeing how it changes over time. But sometimes it might not be like you know, well, what kind of values are we getting? Like, is there a huge difference in values? This one again, distribution. So you can see already here, because you have density plot, a box plot, uh, heat maps. I don't think we've got too many heat maps. Maybe it's full linearity, but um, that's these are the different plots we can do. So this one I think I uh, okay, I did show. I think there's one I showed the code itself. So. And again, this is just from the curriculum. So histogram. Um, Probably mention a couple things. So one of the reasons why we would do this is like checking for normality. So like we kind of assume a lot of for statistical testing that we have a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution of the data. And if it's not, you know, it might be a good thing to check it out and make sure that is in fact distributed. Um, and then also it can check on our raw and transform data. So for example, we'll look at for when we um, do, for example, moving trends, we'll do transformations. It might be good to check on the distribution of the data um, after we do a transformation. So these are a couple of reasons why you do distribution. Okay. So this, for example, is just our histogram. It's essentially nothing too fancy, right? But we basically can see the distribution of these different values. For example, um, some monthly returns give us, you know, 0.06, only about four of them. 
I'm, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of distortion in your audio. Oh, is it? Oh, my bad. I wonder actually if this is my wrong mic. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You get it. All right. It is. Let's see here. Okay. Is that any better? Than the mic? Oh, that's a lot better. <laughs> yeah, that's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have my mic. Uh, usually I usually have a separate mic when I'm talking, so that's funny. All right, cool. Um, sorry. Uh, anyway, um, so if we have a histogram, our next um, choice, like so our histogram is very coarse. So what are some other choices we can do to plot density out? Um, I think you suggested that I start with the K, uh, is that the KDE? KDE, uh, our kernel density estimation, right? So. SR parametric. One way you could also do is maybe do something like Gaussian, but we probably won't have a full Gaussian in this case, right? So we could use a KDE, for example, and that uses our parametric values versus, you know, our histogram, right? And you can see this gives us a nice smooth part. It's like, okay, that looks about normal, right? You know, maybe not perfect. It actually tends to be more on the positive side, just very slightly, slightly skewed on that side. But um, we can see it. you would generally think that most cases there's some ups or some downs, so you're around zero. So that kind of makes sense, okay? So KDE would help us do our density plot, right? So um, our next one here is our plot, box plot. And box plots can be really useful when we actually wanna show the distribution over time. So this is kind of a little weird, but like you can imagine like saying from 1960, you know, 1961, and you wanna say, what's the distribution for each year? So maybe some years there's a lot of wild fluctuations and other times maybe there's like pretty much like no fluctuation at all. We can use that distribution. Um, seasonal trends, like I said, you know, if there tends to be trends per season, we can group that distribution and see, for example, let's say one year, the temperature varies like wildly. It goes like really cold and really hot one year. Um, but overall, is the trend of the temperature up or down or in a certain area? Okay. So this kind of helps us do things. And again, finding outliers, like that's a good thing to know. So if we have one weird, weird particular value, it doesn't throw off our whole time series either. Okay. So an example of this, um, this is not, again, this is probably not the best one because we're using stock data. So stock data doesn't really have seasonal changes, but you can see here for each year, we can have and see a general uh, distribution. So you can see, for example, from 1961, we had a lot more variation compared to 1964. And you can see in 1965, we had a very small distribution except for these big outliers right here. So you can see like, oh, these were huge outliers, but overall, um, they kind of kept a relatively small distribution. And of course, you know, we have um, our, quartile range, our mean, you know, we can figure these parts out. Uh, so this can be useful, especially for seasonal data. But again, for, for stock data, it's not the best, but it's still good to see, okay? All right, and our last one is our heat maps, okay? And so heat maps actually are a pretty cool one. Um, if you remember, basically we use color to signify uh, strength and stuff like that. So basically saying like, okay, like, um, is there a very high value here, a very low value here? And again, uh, I like, use heat maps in particular because heat maps can be useful for people because we just are a very visual you know species right so you can see here again time series or not time series new york uh stock exchange data it's not usually the best because we can't see patterns over time kind of thing um, but you can see here for example uh red usually means in this case i believe higher values see this is where actually putting in um the different oh this is actually really important too is you should always be aware of your heat map what color spectrum you use so, um, you know, ones also have legend, but also like people tend to use like the green, yellow, red thing, which tends to be pretty good. Um, one times I see is people use the full spectrum of like the rainbow, which is actually really difficult to read if you think about it. Like it's not really sure like what is, what is higher, like is purple higher or is it blue? So usually people do like cool colors to, you know, uh, warmer colors um, also. If you're making a visualization for someone else, be aware of colorblindness. Um, there's like a pretty high portion of people who are colorblind. Uh, the good thing is that there are um, packages that are specific color um, styles for the colorblind. So make sure like you use those things. For example, don't use red on green. Um, that's the most common form of colorblindness. And if you have uh, green basically on red, a lot of color people, colorblind people cannot read that stuff or can't make the distinction. That's why actually that green, red, yellow, even though it makes a lot of sense, probably because of like, you know, traffic lights, it's probably not the best thing to show distribution of data. 
just be aware of those kind of things. Okay. Uh, but again, here you can see is that uh, this is each year, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1960, 1961, 2, 3, 4, uh, I guess up to 1966. So each one is a year and each of these are a month. So basically, if there were more things like, um, if we had more seasonal data, we might see, for example, these, all these ones tend to be on the higher side and then it goes lower and then higher again. Um, in this case, we don't really have much of a pattern, but you can kind of get that grouping and that way it's kind of um, stacked on top of each other. So you can see if it tends to be like, let's say it tends to be really low values right here and it to be really high values at the beginning of the data. Okay. So, I, have a, I have a question. So this is um, the most similar to the uh, line plots of different, yeah, no, different, different subplots, right? Yeah, let's see. Um, we can maybe do a quick uh, yeah, 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 uh, Grouping plots. Come on, where are you? So it's probably closer to like this, right? Yeah, so you can kind of see that same idea. It's like, okay, you can see each year by itself and then each month. That's almost, if I do this part, you can see kind of similar, except in this case, we're having a block in that sense. Yeah, I see. Because with this particular oh, data, this map, right? heat map doesn't really make sense to yeah, me. But mm -hmm. but seeing the analogy between them, yeah, makes it, like an, another kind of data, it could make sense. Yeah, this this is not the per this is not the perfect data set for a heat map. Um, I probably should have pulled maybe together like a different data set that has this, for example, um, temperature over like a year. For example, would probably be more like obvious. Like obviously, you'd have like lower temperatures in January and then higher temperatures, you know, for the summer and then back into when we get into fall into winter going low again. So you probably would see something like, let's say, you know, blue over here, then red right here and then blue. And then you would see kind of a similar pattern for each year. Now you might also see that each year is slightly warmer for each, you know, um, what's a column right here, but each row itself would have the same structural pattern. Another thing that occurs to me is if, if you had that kind of data, you could say, well, in all these other rows in this season, it was at this, at this amount. But for some reason in this row in that same season, it was really different. So what happened? Yeah, we are. Exactly. And yeah, it's, it makes it more structured where you can very quickly see, oh, look at this column or look at this row. You can compare those columns very quickly. Um, the, again, colors. It, Essentially, the colors are useful to give like an extra dimension. That's a little harder for us to just be able to visualize by itself. Like you can see, like comparing, like if you could imagine something like that, this kind of data versus a format. Oops, could I do this? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, compared to something like this, this might be a little harder to like. You can kind of see. I mean, there's not really a pattern here, so it's kind of hard to tell. But like, it might be harder to look at these graphs all at once versus like seeing all this color as one big picture. I'm also really glad you brought up the accessibility because that would never occur to me. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Um, these are actually things um, you should uh, should always be aware of, especially because I mean, part of your data science job is communication. Like, one is to find patterns to basically go through the data, but also is to communicate these results and to communicate um, com to communicate well. Also means being aware of people's accessibility. Um, basically, like what, like I mean, a simple one, like for example, if you're making a chart or if you're making a presentation, you don't put a bunch of words. You don't put it really small. You know, like you want to make visuals. You basically want your whole point of um, visuals, in my opinion, is one. You know, you can use it to basically find trends for yourself, but also present information to someone else. And so, if someone can't see that very well, in the sense of that, you know, if they're colorblind, for example. Um, that might be good. For example, um, there's also, I can go really deep into this too, but um, if you're deaf, for example, or hard of hearing, um, it might be difficult for you to hear certain patterns in uh, audio data and to make a visualization of those kind of things and be able to say, okay, how is this accessible? So again, uh, something to keep in mind, but um, yeah. Nice thing is that, especially for colorblind, because it's such a common thing um, in the general population, there are a lot of packages that are specifically colorblind enabled modes. So cool. All right, awesome. Um, any other questions before we move on to different types of trends um, and thinking about visualization?